Hello and welcome to episode 23 of Four Random Books. Today's episode we're going to call... Hmm. We're going to call Fingers of the 1930s, broadly speaking. Thoughts on the 1930s. We're going to start off with Theodore Roosevelt, because... And this night not being in the 1930s, being president, it's his nephew, Franklin. He does, in many ways, start off a lot of the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Uh, approach to the world with the doctrine he brings in, in during his presidency. And it, this doctrine is inspired by his own research, you know. Naval operations of the war between Great Britain and the United States, 1812 to 1815 otherwise known as the War of 1812. The important factor on the British side was the use of the Navy to blockade the American coast. When war was declared, and the Napoleonic struggle was at its height, and the chances seemed on the whole to favour Napoleon. But by the spring of 1813, the Grand Army had gone to its death in the snow-clad wastes of Russia, and Wellington had completely bested the French masters in Spain. So that was merely a question of time as to when he would invade France. In Germany, the French were steadily using ground, and all the nations of Europe were combining for the overthrow of that splendid, evil, and terrible genius before whom they had so long cowered. Britain could, therefore, afford to turn her attention to America in earnest. As yet, she could not spare adequate land forces, but she could and did spare a sufficiency of battleships, frigates, and sloops to make a real blockade of the American coast. After May 1813, the blockade was complete from New York southward. In the autumn, it was extended further east, but it was not until the following year that it was applied with the same iron severity to the New England coast. The British government hoped always that the seditious spirit of New England would manifest itself in an open revolt. After the blockade had been once established, commerce ceased, and the only vessels that could slip out were the far-sailing privateers and regular cruisers, whose captains combine daring, caution, and skill in such equal proportions as to enable them to thread their way through the innumerable dangers that barred their path. The privateers frequently failed, and even the regular cruisers were by no means always successful. While the risks were too great for merchantmen habitually to encounter them, Georgia touched Florida, and so could do a little trade through the Spanish dominions. And the northern England, New England coast lay open for some time to come, but elsewhere the ships rotted at the ports, though the shipwrights found employment in building the swift privateers and the sailor folk in manning them. The white-sailed British frigates hovered in front of every seaport of note, standing on and off with a ceaseless, unwearing vigilance by day and night, in fair weather and foul, through the summer and through the winter. In the great estuaries, fleets rode at anchor, or sailed hither and thither, menacing destruction. No town, large or small, could deem itself safe, and every great river was a possible high road for the entrance of the enemy. There was not a ship off the American coast over which the Americans could call themselves masters, seaward of the point where the water grew deep enough to float a light craft of war. The one lesson which should be most clearly taught by this war is the folly of a nation's relying for safety upon anything but its own readiness to repel attack, and in case of a power with extended seaboard, this readiness implies the possession of a great fighting navy. The utter failure of Jefferson's embargo and his other measures to what he termed peaceable coercion teach their part of lesson so painful, plainly that it would seem impossible to misread it, but the glory won by their little navy has tended to blind Americans to the fact that this navy was too small to anything except do anything except win glory. It lacked the power to harm anything but Britain's pride, and it was too weak to parry a single blow delivered by the British along the coast, when once they realised their task was serious and set about it in earnest. I agree. Modern Naval Strategy, Admiral Sir Reginald Bacon.
published in 1940. The dictionary definition of strategy is the science of military command. This confines strategy to military use and purpose. It has, however, in these days, a far wider application. A better modern definition would be plans made with a view to obtaining desired results. Many people shy at the word strategy. It has to them an almost occult sound, hiding an abstruse meaning. His strategy lies at the root of many of the small dramas belayed in home life. Few wives fail to bring strategy to their aid if forced by, faced by the problem of how to obtain consent to a proposal they feel be met with doubtful acceptance by an uncomplacent husband. The problem is approached with due thought, a plan spread out over many days, perhaps is carefully sketched out. Every form of artfulness is employed until the success of the strategy culminates in the proposal coming from the lips of the husband. For the success in business and manufacture, strategy is absolutely necessary. It is useful for a firm to handle a man or manufacture goods which it cannot sell. It has been rightly said, anyone can invent a thing, anyone can manufacture it, but it takes a genius to sell it. It is not an uncommon belief amongst pacifists and other super superficial fingers that an armour firm spends time and money in peacetime trying to foment war. This is an utter fallacy. The peace strategy of firm is totally different. If confusion, confutation is necessary, we have only to look back on how the aftermath of war hit the firms of Armstrong, Whitworth, Vickers and the Coventry Ordnance Works. Two former had to write down a large proportion of their capital, ultimately and ultimately amalgamated. Millions of their shareholders' money was thereby thrown into the waste paper basket. The Coventry Orders Works had to close down and disappear from the manufacturing world. None of these firms desired war. It is true that during a war, the increasing production means increasing gross profits, but at the same time, expenses taxation go up, fresh capital has to be expended, and after the war comes a slump. No. The prayer of the armaments of the manufacturers is give peace in our time, my lord. Their peace strategies, therefore, are based not on agitation, but on the selling of their products and increasing the volume of their markets. To this end, they employ agents gifted with charm of manner and of transport and honesty. These men, arriving in foreign countries, make friends with those in power, askew local politics, and devote their energies to spreading the respect for the firm they represent. Their propaganda aims at keeping the names of their employees before the public eye. While the quality of their manufacturers is allowed to speak for them, their personalities smooth the way for many orders coming to them instead of to their rivals. Many of her firms would, could quote cases in which their peaceful strategy worked its quiet way for many years before any results materialized to recompense them for their labors. To be honest, that's diplomacy. That is presence. <laughs> that is a strategy so subtle that it doesn't really conform to any no current notions of strategy, which might be why it's such a hard sell in the halls of power. Trent Chard and Sasser. On the supremacy of air power over sea power, Git Lerge Donna Denal, um, Luftkriegs uh, Kriegsholen, the papers of the Royal Norwegian Air Force Academy, volume 17. And yes, I do try and collect them. They are good. I know I might occasionally take the piss out of the Norwegian Navy, but their academies produce some very good thinking officers. <laughs> Marshall Fox said that no war is like the previous war. Many thinkers support this view. On the other hand, a large number of military and naval theorists are continually stating that the principles of war never change while they proceed to lay down methods as though they were in principles. Methods, though, change. There is no such thing as an academic war. Every war is different. 
although certain characteristics are common to most. To be honest, anyone who writes there's no such thing as an academic war has never seen the art of the fights that can go on over the last chocolate bourbon. Since the world started, wars have been fought on land and sea. The army moves forward or backward, right or left, until stopped by seas, rivers or mountains. With every yard advances or retreats, the army's problems alter. Methods of solving those changing problems must be varied to suit the geographical features of the ground. The sea and the air encounter fewer obstacles than the army. The navy moves forward and backward, right or left, until stopped by land or rocks. And then it can occasionally apply large amounts of high explosive to move those land or rocks. The air has no barrier save weather, and even that is being swiftly overcome. It does run out of fuel, though. It can move forward, backward, left, right, up or down, in an immense three-dimensional space which appears so vast that few people understand it. And whether it affects all three services in more or less equal proportions, the army by floods, mud and cold, the navy through gales, fogs and heavy seas, and the air by fog and icing up. Fighting in three dimensions is unique. It never happened before the Great War, and then only few realised the development it foreshadowed. And such a starting innovation can uh, never happen again. Submarines. Also, fight in three dimensions in that they can move up, down, so in their medium, or all over the place. And they do. The Royal Navy and the capital ship in the interwar period. An operational perspective by Joseph Moretz. Pictures. This is, of course, one of the Rutledge books. Expect to be bankrupted. Provision to war naval strategy. If we wait till Japan shows a warlike tendency before making our essential preparations, she will never allow us to complete them. Commander Bertram Watson. Fairly sensible on Japan's part. If there is a naval war between Great Britain and Germany during the next 10 years, we shall control German overseas communications by exactly the same means as we did in the last war. A sea bell. That works as long as Norway doesn't fall and France doesn't fall. Either of those things happen, you have problems. A strategical plan which fails to provide means for tactical success is foredoomed to failure. Naval War Manual 1925. It actually says a lot more than that. I might do a four random books on, na on various archive documents. We should have lost the Battle of Trafalgar on a staff appreciation. Arnold Chatfield. Yes, we should have on a staff appreciation. If anyone had by it, that's but a staff appreciation is based on the enemy being the same skill level as you are. Which, let's be honest, with the French and the Spanish in the uh, time of Trafalgar is not a sensible idea. Whereas when you're facing against the Germans in World War One, well, they'd be competent sailors, whether they're competent naval strategists is a different matter. World War Two, no, they're good, but frankly, as I often say, the Italian fleet was the bit greater threat. Military activity is a complex heterogeneous and has both vertical and horizontal dimensions. At the highest level, strategy considers the employment of the military forces to achieve objectives of policy. It defines goals, assigns forces to a given theater of operations, and establishes the limits of their use. By its nature, strategy is concerned with the broadest of issues and must weigh the competing demands of military forces from separate theaters of operations. As a step removed, the operational level plans and conducts a military campaign in a defined geographic theatre in furtherance of the overall strategic objective. Finally, the tactical level is concerned with actual engagement with military force in battle. 
It must be noted that such an ordering of warfare owes much to military thinking and the expansion of the battlefield. And I would argue much of it is land focused, but it can be applied to the sea in certain circumstances. I'm not sure about the operational one. I hope you enjoy that. Thank you. And um, see you next week for another four random books. Probably see you in a couple of lives, hopefully, in the meantime, though. Well, a live and a brew ship. This goes out on Wednesday. Take care.